Hello, Facebook friends. Michelle Edmonds here with Idaho News 6. Welcome back to school. That's the edition of this week's Making the Grade, especially for the school district that is the largest in our state, West Ada, having its first day back, 40,000 students trying to get back to school for the first time since March yesterday. We have a lot of hot topics to talk about. And of course, we'd always love your questions, your thoughts, your comments, and we'll bring some of those in live as I have my discussion with this week's Making the Grade, our superhero all the way from Boise, Idaho, Kevin Richards from Idaho Education News. Kevin, how are you, my friend? I'm, I'm doing well. How are you doing over there? Hanging in there, because as you well know, if you join us for Making the Grade, you know my personal story is that I have a high school and a middle schooler in the West Ada District, and yesterday was a bit rough, I have to just say. And, you know, and we knew it would be. So I just, I give a shout out to all the educators and administrators who are working so hard during this time to try and figure it out. But Kevin, let's start because as I said, 40,000 students headed back to school remotely, at least for this next week or so in West Ada. And there were internet problems right from the very start. A lot of connectivity issues right away for, for West Ada. Um, you know, and we kind of chronicled it over the course of the day, hearing from parents who were frustrated trying to help uh, help their students navigate. Um, and, and I'm sure that frustration, certainly across the board, not just parents and, and students, but for, for teachers and staff trying to get this started in, in some sort of, uh, you know, in, in some sort of an orderly fashion. We knew it was going to be tough. I mean, I think everybody knew coming in that there, there, there's a lot you have to try to do to make this happen. And, you know, I, you know, I, I don't think it should be terribly surprising that there were, that there were problems along the way. Well, and then the interesting move that happened middle of the afternoon, late in the afternoon mm -hmm. yesterday, Central District Health, who manages the Ada County schools, I shouldn't say manages, but has some say over where Ada County schools might fall, and those include Boise, West Ada, and CUNA, has moved Ada County into the yellow category. So red, as we all well know by now, is remote learning only. The yellow category allows the school districts to easily move into that half in-person hybrid model. And all of a sudden, both Boise and West Ada, I think there were a lot of people who were ready to see this move immediately after what happened yesterday in West Ada. Right, and not terribly surprising what we heard from Central District Health. Uh, the district had been hinting towards the fact that uh, it, it might change its recommendation for schools in, in Ada County because the coronavirus case numbers have been slowing down in Ada County. That's been well chronicled over the past couple of weeks. I look at those numbers on a daily basis. Other reporters have been looking at it on a daily basis. And that trend line has been improving. So for Central District Health to recommend that Ada County schools can resume some form of face-to-face -face instruction, not very surprising. But as you mentioned, the timing, uh, you know, in light of what happened with West Ada on Tuesday morning, the announcement uh, from Central District Health early afternoon Tuesday, and then West Ada's announcement that uh, their plan is to start to have students coming back to school next week uh, for you know, for pre-K students and kindergarten students, that's going to be a full day, a uh, full day available, uh, full-time learning, I should say. Uh, other grades, it will be on an alternating schedule, students in school every other day. But they want to move quickly. West Ada wants to get kids back in school uh, on Monday. So very, very quick turnaround. And you know, after what uh, parents and uh, students and teachers have been going through with the online experience. I think there are probably a lot of folks who are you know, looking forward to getting back into some form of face-to-face -face learning at least part of the time and, and hoping that it will stick and that the schools can stay open at least in a, a part-time setting. Kevin, the Boise School District, before yesterday, before the yellow designation came out, had already outlined a plan of what they were looking at should the district move, or the county, that is, move into the yellow category. And it's not as, the plan is not as quick to get students back into the classroom as West Ada has proposed, but that could change, correct? 
Well, it's definitely a, a slower rollout, uh, what Boise is talking about. And the district will make its plans official on Thursday. They're going to make a final decision about what the plans are. But what Boise has signaled that they're doing is much more of a slow rollout. The district is on the record saying students will not be back in school in person, any students in person before September 21st. So that's a full week after West Aid is going to start to have, have kids in school. And even then, the plan that Boise has laid out, only pre-K through second grade students will be back in school on the 21st. And, and even then on an alternating, you know, every other day basis, then you start to bring the other elementary school students in in a couple more in a couple of weeks. Then you bring in the junior high school and high school students a couple of weeks after that. So by Boise's schedule, it's going to take at least a month, unless they change their schedule. What they've got in in you know in place right now, what they're proposing right now, it would take until probably mid October before junior high school and high school students are back in in school for you know, hybrid learning, uh, back in school every other day. So it's uh, you know it's going to take a while. Uh, Boise's plan is a lot more of a slow rollout. Which just goes to local control, which I know that you wrote a story about actually last week at IdahoEdNews.org. People can go back and take a look at that story as well. But it just shows how different the local district each has when it comes to the control over their openings and closings. So take, for example, CUNA, because we just talked about West Ada. We talked about Boise. CUNA, the third school district under Central District's health control in Ada County. But CUNA started the school year in a whole different way. And, and I was curious about their coronavirus case numbers, Kevin, if those are being tracked. Yes. Uh, so CUNA opened last week and they did open to a hybrid learning. They allowed students in last week in spite of Central District Health's recommendations. And I want to emphasize, and we, we see this every week, it feels like, but it, it bears repeating. These are recommendations. The health district is only recommending what to do with schools. It really falls to the district and it falls to the school boards to decide what to do. And CUNA's decision back in late July was to go with hybrid learning, students in class two days a week, learning at home, online the rest of the week. So that was CUNA's plan uh, and they executed it last week. They went into it, but they did have a couple of coronavirus cases. They confirmed two cases in the schools and identified a third case that's a probable case. So three students out of a school of 5,500 students. So it's a you know not a widespread uh, outbreak by any stretch of the imagination. And you know CUNA administrators say that they were able to uh, identify the students who tested positive, the students who did test positive, did not return to school the rest of the week, uh, that they were able to um, you know, address the situation without having to um, you know, quarantine or close entire classrooms or you know, you know, do much more of a, an, a, an aggressive uh, shutdown or anything like that. So. Kevin, can I interrupt you for a second? Okay. Um, we're looking right here at this graph, and I want to bring this up too. Um, if you look on the right side of your screen there, uh, Idaho Ed News has done just an incredible job showing a comparing and contrasting of openings of states, um, school districts all around the state. And, and Joyce had this comment. So as you're talking about the differences and what's happened here, you know, Joyce Haynes is asking, what about the rest of the state? And I didn't want to go past this point here that you have done a ton of work so that everybody can really know what decisions are being made because everybody has local control and that means different decisions are being made. Right, and we're gonna be updating that map on a daily basis as, as things change and as we find out about things that change. And if you look at the map and you see something that's out of date, by all means, we wanna know about that. We wanna keep this as current as possible because we want you know, parents to be able to look at this and see exactly what's happening in their community and how it compares with the rest of the state. But this is going to be a big part of our job, just tracking who's open, who's closed. And it is, again, it is all over the place. We've talked about, you know, what's happening in West Ada. We've talked about what's happening in Boise, CUNA. Nampa, I should point out, is still online only, and they're maintaining uh, an online only schedule. I think we had a comment about what's happening in Nampa. Schools are not open in Nampa. They've gone with online only instruction in Nampa. 
and you know we'll see when and if the the district decides to go with face to face learning. But that's the the situation there. It's different, literally in every community across the state. So my question for you then, Kevin, is the one that my thirteen year old asked me today, okay. and I know I know you don't have a crystal ball, but she said to me today, "Well, how long will we be in yellow?" And it, it's the what twenty four thousand dollar question, one million dollar question. I don't know. You put a price tag on it, but honestly, the question becomes: How fast can school districts move in and out of these phases if it's necessary? You know, I think what we're seeing with West Ada is uh, districts can try to move pretty quickly, and it's going to, you know. Again, it's going to depend on how quickly school districts feel like they can pivot from one thing to another, from one learning uh, regime to another. So, you know, I, I don't have a good answer for your daughter. I mean, it, it could, you know, they could stay in the yellow for, you know, for weeks. It could stay in the yellow for the rest of the school year, for all we know, or, or things could change one way or the other. It really depends on uh, what happens with those case numbers, what happens with the spread, and specifically what happens with case numbers and spread within the schools themselves. I also want to, uh, Sean Kahn is making comments here saying that their kid has been in school for almost three weeks now. Sean, Maybe I'd love to private you know. Private or charter school, but I'm talking about the charter. school district. The Nampa school district has been online from the beginning of the school year, and that's where they remain. That's what I'm talking about, Sean. If you're, if you're also, going to go into a charter school, it may be a different situation entirely. Does the map that we were talking about before, Kevin, that Idaho Ed News has put out, are you tracking just public schools there or are, are, there as well. just so it's the charter schools and the public school districts that we're tracking, not the private schools, but, you know, so we've got, you know, a line for every school district and a line for every charter. I think this is so well done, by the way, and if it's being updated daily. Uh, everybody can get the information they need right there at their fingertips. So idahoednews.org, that's the place to go if you'd like to track this for yourself and see exactly where a district stands, because it's going to be fascinating, as we have pointed out already, to see that some of the Ada County schools are going to go back into a hybrid model as soon as next week, whereas the Nampa School District, the public school district, is planning to remain online at this point because they continue mm -hmm. to be in that red category. That's right. What about higher education? So you and I have talked here on Making the Grade, Kevin, so much about what's happening when the universities and colleges in our state reopen. And there are going to be some interesting factors that come up because the other thing that happened with Central District Health is that when they moved schools or county back into that yellow category in Ada County, they also are allowing bars to reopen in that category. And as we all know, there was some worry back when we had conversations with Dr. Marlene Trump at Boise State that having the bars closed may have helped keep the coronavirus numbers down when it came to college students. This is gonna be an interesting mix that happens. It really will be. I mean, let's look at the numbers that the universities have put out just in the past few days. So Boise State is reporting that they had uh, 32 cases uh, on campus last week. That's quadruple what they saw uh, the previous week. So the numbers definitely spiked. By no means are they what we're seeing at other colleges and universities across the country, where we're seeing, in some cases, hundreds of students testing positive. So. Boise State's situation is not uh, as dire as we're seeing on other campuses across the country, but the numbers did trend upwards. You're right. I think, you know, Marlene Trump, uh, C. Scott Green at the University of Idaho, university presidents, college presidents will tell you that, that their biggest concern is what happens with students off hours, what happens with students on weekends. These are college students. You know, part of the college culture, part of the college experience is to spend time with your classmates and to go and, and you know, you know, and, and you know, have a good time with your classmates. That's part of the college experience. But how do you do that safely? And how do you do that without uh, it, you know, leading to an outbreak on campus? That's the big challenge. And that's going to be, uh, again, that's going to tell the tale about whether the colleges and universities can remain open with what they're doing, which is a blend of face-to-face -face learning and online learning. 
And there was a lot of talk before the Labor Day weekend about what would happen on college campuses two weeks from now when you know that coronavirus cases could spike if there were large gatherings of people together and the virus was allowed to spread. So again, what happens right now with Ada County being moved into a yellow category really could not I mean, we don't know what's going to happen come a week from now or two weeks from now. It's just these unknown factors that are out there. And we have to follow what Central District Health says with uh, their tracking. Right. We, we don't know. But, you know, to, to the university's credit, they're all updating their, their websites with, with, uh, with the latest numbers. We talked about Boise State's numbers. University of Idaho uh, posted some new numbers uh, earlier this week. Four new cases uh, based on testing up at the U of I campus. That's a lower number of new cases. We had the 24 new cases the, the previous week, so four cases this week. But the percentage of positive test results went up. And the reason for that is what you saw before and what you saw with these 24 new cases, a lot more testing as the university tested students at the beginning of the semester to, to see if they tested negative so they could attend class. Now, the testing is a lot more targeted. It's uh, targeted at you know students who may be more likely to to have coronavirus. You know, it may be more uh, targeted towards students who are showing symptoms. So the case numbers are dropping. The percentage of positive results increasing. But even at that, the percentage of positive test results they say is at about two percent. That's a pretty low percentage, especially compared to what you're seeing statewide and what you're seeing uh, at the the health district level. So two percent. Not a huge, uh, huge percentage by any means. As Idaho Ed News has reported, Kevin, in a number of stories now since colleges and universities had started to open, though, is that they're seeing their student populations pretty much playing by the rules when it comes to what they say needs to be done to keep college campuses open, too. Right. And but you've also seen that the universities had to step in and, you know, in Boise State's case, suspend students and uh, fraternities for uh, large gatherings that were in violation of the coronavirus protocols. Let's talk numbers and sense a little bit, uh, because their school funding and what's happening with the pandemic is all tied to state revenue as well. And as you and I have talked about, Kevin, all state agencies, by request of the governor, were asked to cut budgets by 5%. And that includes the public school education budget, which makes up for the largest amount of our tax dollars in the state where they go. And the revenue forecasts right now are reading a bit optimistic, which, again, more good news for making the grade, perhaps. Right. Two months into the budget year, surprisingly strong tax collections coming in. And, you know, it's an, it's an encouraging sign going into the rest of this budget year. And, you know, we are a long way out. I mean, it's a, you know, like I say, the, the new budget year just began on July 1st, and it began with those holdbacks that you talked about, those 5% budget cuts that we talked about that, that Governor Little imposed because there were concerns that the revenue was going to, to shrink uh, because of the, uh, the COVID-related downturn. So you do have the $99 million cut for public education. You do have uh, you know, about, I want to say about a $15 million cut for higher education. Those cuts remain in place, but the numbers right now, the tax revenues that are coming in are pretty good. You know, and you know, here you see the numbers, $37 million ahead of projections just in August. Now, folks who watch these budgets and watch these revenue numbers know this, but I think it's it bears repeating the big months, the big budget collection months, the big revenue collection months, they, they don't come until later in the budget year, especially in the spring. April you know, is the big month in terms of revenues you know, for obvious reasons. That's when people file their uh, their state income taxes. That's when those uh, those income tax revenues start to, to pour in. So what's happening these first couple of months, it's a good sign, but by no means is it definitive. But it does go to how a budget showdown could happen in the legislature come 
January, February, March, as the state tries to wrestle with where these dollars go and who has to take the biggest cuts. And as we talked about on making the grade, Kevin, already, the state su superintendent of public instruction, Sherry Ibarra, wants to make sure that teachers on the career ladder get to keep moving up the career ladder so that veteran teachers particularly are not lost or leave the classroom um, or leave the computer, maybe we right. should say, at this point too. So there's there's already some setup there for a struggle over where the dollars go, and that's going to just be fascinating to watch, um, especially as the forecast projections come in. As the forecasts come in, as the revenues start to come in between now and January, it's going to be interesting to see if the, the trend we're seeing so far holds. And what does Governor Little do with those trends? You know, if, you know, how does he, how does the governor write his budget for 21, 22? What does he do in terms of, uh, you know, an, an education budget? What, what does he put into K-12 and higher education? What does he do specifically to uh, Superintendent Navarro's recommendation on teacher pay? Does the governor look at these revenue numbers and say, you know, I think we can do something uh, for teacher salaries? Or does he look at it and say, you know, I'm still really not sure we can commit to something like that? We don't know yet. But these next three months, uh, four months of revenue numbers will give us a, a better sense maybe of where the governor goes with his budget recommendations. And that's, you know, you know that will set the tone for the legislative session as well. What, what is the governor recommending as opposed to what are the agencies recommending as opposed to what is uh, Superintendent Navarro recommending? Joining us on Making the Grade, Kevin Richard from Idaho Education News. Let's bring in a few more of your comments and your thoughts. We love hearing your stories when it comes to your own kids' education or your grandkids or what's happening in the school district with you. Um, because some of these comments, I, fascinating to hear stories that are happening. Uh, Kimber is telling us that my daughter had to be quarantined because there was a positive case in her class and she wasn't provided anything to continue her education. No packets, no tablets, nothing. After one day back, she gets sent home. And again, Kimber, I don't know what school your daughter goes to, but that's the opening and closing that we're talking about here and, and how school districts with local control handle who gets sent home and who doesn't when positive cases show up. Maybe Kevin, go back and talk about what happened in CUNA. Did they have to do some quarantine there? They didn't do quarantining. And in the case of the two students who tested positive who were confirmed positive cases, um, they're saying that those students did not return to school after they tested positive. So I think we're talking about a, a, a student in a second grader in one of the elementary schools showed up and did not show up for you know, class the rest of the week. The same thing with a student in the high school. So no quarantining, no closing of classes. Uh, and they, they said that they were able to avoid uh, doing anything as drastic as that. Kimber's getting back to us now. Central Canyon in the Valley okay. View right. district. Okay. And I know they've had a few cases in Valley View as they've gone uh, through a hybrid learning model. My other question for you, Kevin, and I'm, I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here because you and I talked about it on Making the Grade last week, but I know that the Boise School District in particular is putting kind of out a, a rundown of sense of what schools have virus cases confirmed, if there's been a quarantine. Have you heard of other school districts throughout the state who may be trying to give that information to parents so that it's out there and parents can make good decisions for themselves? That's again going to be something that varies from school to school for a lot of reasons. And one big reason is student privacy. You know, for a Boise school district to do what they're doing, and I commend them for doing this, I make no mistake about that. They're being transparent about how many cases they're seeing in the schools. And that data is going to be even more important in a couple of weeks or a few weeks as students return to those schools. But Boise is a school district with 25,000 kids. So you can put up numbers and say, we've had X number of cases in an elementary school without identifying a student. You get into a smaller school district, some of these rural school districts or a charter school, and you start to drill down to those numbers. It, it gets really, you know, you, you can start to compromise student privacy pretty quickly. And that's a concern. And, you know, 
you know my default is going to be towards disclosure, towards transparency, towards getting information into the hands of the public. In this case, getting the information into the hands of parents so they can make an informed decision about the, their kid's safety. But you know, there are student privacy issues at play here as well. So it's going to vary from, from district to district, charter school to charter school, uh, charter schools as opposed to public schools, because, uh, you know, you know, that, you know, again, it's going to be local control at play. Well, once again, Kevin, we've been saying this since March when schools essentially shut down in one way or another, it'll be fascinating to watch. And we hope to give you right here on Making the Grade the very latest information and the most accurate information so that as parents and as educators, you can make the proper decisions that you need to make to move forward. Kevin, I really appreciate everything that you guys are doing over at Idaho Ed News. I mean, that I know, <laughs> I know from the behind the scenes work, and I'm sure many people could echo that trying to update a map on every public school district in the state and what they're doing when it comes to openings and closings is no easy task. So please thank the staff at Idaho Ed News for their diligent work. No, I appreciate that. We're, we're going to be working on this all year. So, uh, so it's good to hear. A new normal for all of us. Yeah. Kevin, thanks for being here for Making the Grid. We appreciate all of your comments and thoughts, folks, and we'll be back with you next week.